Impact. Real human interest stories ranging from the ordinary to the truly extraordinary. Hello, this is Fatima Hussein, and you're listening to Season 2 of Impact, the program which introduces you to extraordinary human interest stories from around Canada. Mental health in the Afro-Caribbean communities has long been a blind stigma filled with misconceptions and covered with a veil of shame. Black people experiencing a mental health challenge are more likely to hide it or delay seeking help over the fear of being shunned or labelled by society. In this episode, actress, producer, filmmaker and mental health advocate Stacey Ann Buchanan opens up about her trials and triumphs with mental health including giving a voice to black Canadians living with mental illnesses. My name is Stacey M. Buchanan and I'm a mental health advocate. I'm located right here in Toronto. My story started around 2011 when I decided to pack up, leave Toronto and move to Vancouver to pursue my dreams of being an actress. I was 29 at the time and I had put this huge, I would say top hat on success. And to me, success was either you're married and having kids or, or having the super career and I didn't have either. And so I gave myself six months to really make it and to be super famous and to have this career because I felt like I wasn't successful. And I put a lot of pressure on myself because 30 was approaching and here I am in this glorious country, migrated from Jamaica and I felt like coming from where my poor upbringing to being here, I have to make my family proud. I have to make everyone proud. So I have to make it. And I put this huge amount of pressure on myself. So I moved to Vancouver and I got settled in. I got myself an agent and I was doing auditions here and there, booking little commercials here and there but I wasn't booking anything substantial and, or anything that I can say, wow, I've made it. And I remember I had a roommate at the time and I just remember I started experiencing these things where my heart was beating really fast and I wasn't eating. Or if I did eat, I was eating like I was in a race and I had headaches. I was just doing everything fast. I, I couldn't slow down and my roommate said, you're showing the signs of anxiety. I think you have anxiety. And I just remember going into my bedroom and closing the door and thinking to myself, anxiety? That's something white girls get. I've never heard heard of a black person getting anxiety and this was 2011 and I was 29 years old that was my ignorance I never associated anxiety with black people at all in all my studies in school, I took theater and I took film. And I was like either one of the only black girls or one of a small group of black girls. And I would hear my friends talk about mental illness. Well, not mental illness per se, but saying that they have anxiety. They're super stressed out. They can't take it anymore because work was so intense, you know? And I was like, I, I really can't talk like that at home. I can't really bring those kind of conversations at home to my dad. So I just thought it was something that never really affected black people. And I, I kind of brushed it aside. But then I remember this one day I was walking. I was actually going to Wendy's and my my heart was beating so fast. It felt like my heart was in this cage and it was beating a million miles per second and it was getting bigger and bigger and the cage was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. I just remember I stopped on the road and I knocked my chest a couple times because I'm like, I feel like I'm going to die. I, I, I'm going to die. And I, I had to check myself into the hospital at that time. And they ran a whole bunch of tests, blood tests, CAT scan, everything trying to figure out. And the doctor came back and he said, you have anxiety. And he prescribed Valium. And I remember looking at the prescription and I was just thinking, I did a scene in acting school and Valium is a crazy people drug. They're telling me that I'm crazy. And so I said, you know what? I'm going to beat this thing. And I just kept on repeating the mantra to myself, mind over matter. And I thought I beat it for a good couple of days. It came back in a way where I felt like I had the shakes and I felt like my heart was like either in my throat or was just like about to explode. And you know, you feel like you're in this spot where you feel like you have control, but you have no control. They kept me in the hospital because I went back. They kept me on a treadmill. I went home with a heart monitor. They kept on asking me, what is it that you're thinking about that is making you so stressed out and giving you anxiety? And I knew what it was. I knew it was my fear of coming back home to Toronto, not accomplishing all the goals that I set out for myself that I wanted to do and basically that I wanted to prove to people that I'm a success. Not myself, really. It's just culturally, I felt like I couldn't let my parents down. I couldn't let my family down in Jamaica. I couldn't let the entire country down. I put so much pressure on myself. My family pleaded for me to come back to Toronto and just the fear of coming back here and being labeled as a loser, my anxiety then spiraled into depression and it was suicidal depression. And this is what people don't understand. My depression came in two stages. 
And depression can come in two stages. There was a stage where it's the typical one where I didn't shower for days. I didn't brush my teeth for days. I didn't comb my hair for days. The blinds were closed. I wasn't talking to anybody. I didn't reply to texts or phone calls. And I love replying to texts or phone calls. You will never not get me to answer my texts or phone calls. And then the other side was where I got super dolled up and I had my makeup on and the most expensive clothes from head to toe. And I went out and I partied a lot and because I was hiding the fact that I was sick because I knew I was sick on the inside. I didn't know how to heal myself or to help myself so I figured if I pretend that I'm happy if I put on a facade of happiness or I look amazing then I'll be happy and that is also depression and people don't know sometimes when people are trying to mask their despair and mask what's going on they pretend that everything is okay and that's what I did I had the two forms of depression the only person that I felt comfortable talking to about this was my father. And I went to him and I was just telling him that I just didn't like the thoughts that were going in my head. These thoughts are basically telling me to end my life. And my dad told me to just drink some tea, read my Bible and pray about it. Everything will be okay. And I listened. I drank a lot of tea. I prayed constantly and I was just reading my Bible and hoping everything would be okay. It wasn't okay. I went back to my dad again and he said to do it again. Just drink some tea, read your Bible. And I was like, daddy, it's not working. And my dad's biggest fear is this. He did didn't want me to tell anybody what was going on because for some reason he didn't want it to go down to a friend is going to tell another friend that's going to tell another friend and someone's going to reach back home but he is raising a mad daughter so that was his fear so he told me one time I went back to him again I went to him on three occasions the third occasion he said since you like to chat so much how about you tell your business to strangers and that ignorant comment was what saved my life because when I was at a park I remember I was just going through one of my moments and a lady came over and she asked me what was wrong and pouring everything out out to a complete stranger because I felt safe because she doesn't know me she doesn't know my name she doesn't know my family she doesn't know anything so here I am I could trust and for a while before I saw professional help strangers were my therapy I was just trying to still figure out what I wanted to do in life. And I got the idea to do the show called The Mystic Effect, which marries all the elements of art into one production. I did the show. People love the show. They said, you have to do it again. So I was coming out with it the next year and I was going to launch my company. And there were a little talks saying, who is this girl? Like, where did she come from? And I remember being so upset hearing those negative talks because I was just like, these people have no idea. I almost took my own life. It takes 10 years to be an overnight success. 10 years of really building and grinding and trying to figure out your Yourself. I just remember telling my dad, my dad said to me, there are two things in life you cannot control. It's what people say about you, what they think about you. You can only control your reaction. And my reaction was the blind stigma. I decided to let people know what I've been through. At first I was going to write a book and I said, no, let me be a little bit more creative and create a documentary that shows mental health within the black community specifically. And I'm not just going to share my story. I'm going to get the stories of other people so people can relate and people can see that this is something that was serious. So I took a year and I researched. I researched people online who were bold and brave enough to share their story and I reached out to them. I would say it was easy to get the voices together because people were ready to talk. It was easy to get the female black voices together. To get the black male point of view was the hardest thing ever because I knew friends that went through it, but to go on camera and to say it, that's the stigma, that's the veil of shame that we wear and no one was really able to do that except for Freddie King. He was the youngest of the bunch of us that did it and he was like, no, I'm ready to talk about this. And it took that one guy, it took Freddie King coming on that documentary and saying it for other people to be open up and be like okay I'm ready to talk it only takes one person you know to say this happened to me too and everyone can come in and realize that they're not alone in my classes, in my theater class at film school, the majority of my friends were white and I would hear them openly talk about having anxiety. So I honestly just thought it was something white girls get because I've never heard another black person ever in my life share that they have anxiety. I don't believe there was any friction or criticism when I decided to seek help because I did it privately. But also when I came up with the documentary, there was no friction. It was like a release, like, thank you. That documentary opened up so many dialogues, so many conversations of saying, oh my God, thank you, finally, thank you. It was one of those things where people were walking around with a lot of baggage and a lot of stigma and a lot of shame. And they just needed a voice, someone to come out and say, this has happened to me too. I don't want to say it like it's the way I look. Because when people think about mental illness, you think, about it's the haggard person the person that's homeless the person that is quote unquote mad as we like to say in Jamaica that's walking around talking to nobody you think of that as mental illness but when you look at somebody that looks normal like me and you're like oh my god thank you so nothing is wrong with me if that can happen to Stacey Ann who looks so normal it can happen to anyone so it is happening to me so I feel like I'm not alone 
as a collective black people we've been through so much we're talking about trauma we're talking about being enslaved we're talking about ancestral trauma we're talking about so much that we've been through and it's this whole collective umbrella of being the strong black man and the strong black woman and if we're going through anything that is affecting us mentally we're not supposed to talk about it we can talk about cancer we can talk about diabetes we can talk about physical illness but mental illness is something that we shouldn't even touch we shouldn't even talk about because we should just brush it off and it will be okay we have our faith and everything will be okay and we wear a lot of stigma we carry a lot first is the veil of shame we don't like to be shamed we wear that a lot and we don't want to open up we don't want to say hey this is happening to me and then there is sometimes if there's one person say for instance in a family that you know is mentally ill that person is a big elephant in a room that nobody addresses and nobody talks about or that one cousin that one uncle that one auntie that you know isn't quite there but you know we're not going to talk about it she's fine maybe she was obvious maybe someone put a spell on her she's fine that's the elephant in the room it's a shame like i said it is the dust it's a dirty little secret dust that you keep putting under the mat we're not supposed to talk about it it's okay everything will be okay the biggest stigma and the most deadly stigma is the silent killer that mental illness is in the black community and i don't think a lot of people know that i don't think a lot of people know that it is killing us and a lot of people are walking around yeah they're walking around but inside they're they're completely dead and i say that with no regret saying that because i know i was one of those people you walk around and you think that you're okay you look okay but inside you're completely dead and you're completely empty and that slowly is eroding and irritating you it's slowly eating away at you until like you can't take it no more We've been keeping the shame for so long, we don't really talk about it. And to talk about it too, we don't really see people like us to talk about it. A lot of times it's like, am I gonna go to a white therapist? Am I gonna go to somebody that doesn't understand my journey, my pain, everything that is inflicted upon us, everything that we have to go through? A lot of times we don't see people that look like us that we can talk to. Even if we see somebody that looks at us, this is the contradictory part. I don't know, maybe if I tell her, maybe she knows somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody and then maybe my business is gonna be out there. The majority of it is just this big umbrella of shame that we carry around and, and I think we're putting that down finally. I am tired as black men and black women. I think we're just saying we are so tired and we want to be healthy. We want to let it go. We just want to heal. Once people come on out and people know that they're not alone and can say, hey, this is happening to me, it creates a conversation. A conversation then creates dialogue. It's conversation, but it creates awareness. Awareness will then create a community that's willing for change. When you're willing to change the stigma, you're creating resources. So I think we're in the steps where we're talking about it now. There is awareness that is happening now. And I think what we're doing is we're creating our community. We're starting to write our own narratives. We're not a part of this huge collective of this is what happens and this is what happened. We're creating our own narratives because we're opening our mouth. We're sharing what is happening to us. And then we're in the processes of creating resources. It honestly began with a documentary and after the documentary doing talks and the community deemed me a mental health advocate. I was honored because I'm continuously talking about it, continuously using the platform that I have to share. Even if I give tips and advice on how to maintain your mental health and maintain anxiety because that's something that I still live with. But I know my trigger points. I know how to keep my anxiety at bay per se. And I always share with my social media, with my audience and people really appreciate that. And what I love is that there's so many other black Canadians that are amazing advocates and that are open in a platform and continuously talking about it and sharing tips and sharing resources. It's a small community, but it's a powerful community. And I'm just honored to be one of the black mental health advocates in Canada. I feel like my fate saved my life and I feel like just having that belief that my purpose wasn't quite lived out yet was the reason why I'm still here today. But faith also, religion also, especially in the black community, can be something that stifles a person from admitting they have mental illness or they're going through it or they're experiencing it and they're living with it. It could be looked upon as something to mask. It could be looked upon as evil spirits are upon you. It could be looked upon as just really pray 
pray, pray about it and everything will be okay. And sometimes it's not addressed. Like if we have a doctor for physical ailments or physical illness, where, when, how, and why is it not okay to also seek professional help and seek a doctor for our mind as well? And I think that's where it contradicts a bit. It could be looked upon as, no, no, we'll get a whole bunch of people around you and pray for you and continue to read your Bible, read the scriptures and isolate yourself and everything will be okay. And no, it is not okay. It's okay to say it's okay to have faith. It's okay to believe in God and believe in Jesus and also to do therapy. It's okay to have both. And I want people to know that there is no competition. There's no feeling like, oh, you're not a true Christian because I speak from the Christianity point of view because I am a Christian. There's no point to say, oh, I'm not a true Christian because I'm not just relying on the word of God to help me. And here I am seeking therapy. Like I feel like there's a contradiction. No, it goes hand in hand. And I think if a lot of people knew that, they'll be okay to be like, okay, this is normal. This is okay for me to do. And if a lot of leaders stress that as well say that as well let their members of the church let people know that it's okay you can go outside and you can seek outside professional help for what is going on with you I'll say the first thing to do is to own it. I say to own it because when you when you live in denial, you prolong it and proudly own it because whatever you're going through, whatever it's anxiety, depression, schizophrenia, whatever you're going through, you are not your diagnosed illness. You are not that. And once you own your story, you own that, then find someone that you are comfortable speaking to about it and sharing about it. Just open up that channel for you to let the negative thoughts and to let let these thoughts go out and once you've done that build the courage within yourself to say you know what let me seek professional help let me research where i want to go and let me seek professional help and don't think for one second that seeking professional help is gonna make your illness bigger it is gonna help you don't think for one second that you're bringing shame on yourself don't think for one second that you're weak because you're seeking help because we think we're strong but in actuality strong is asking for help when you can do it no more seek and ask for the help it is there do your research and and if it starts like i said if it starts with you telling a confident you telling somebody that you trust with that information or like me if you want to tell a stranger strangers are amazing therapy but if you want to tell somebody just find an outlet where you know you can finally let some of that go because you'll feel a release and then build up until you can say you know what i'm bold and i'm brave enough right now i'm gonna go seek professional help i'm gonna do this for me you're not doing it for anybody else you're doing this for yourself next year i'm coming out with part two i've listened to the audience with part two i am digging deep to the root i am digging deep i'm not just getting people stories of trials and triumphs i'm getting the clinical research side the people that are the therapists the psychotherapists i'm getting the people that have the lived experiences too yes i'm getting the caregivers as well and i'm getting people to share their story not just in canada but worldwide the blind stigma part two is a podcast and the reason why i chose the podcast is number one being a mom i realize i don't have much time to view things but i can listen and when you listen you open up this huge channel and i feel like you can be driving and listening to something you could be feeding your baby you could be cleaning the house you could be putting on your makeup you could be getting dressed like you can listen to this podcast and i feel with the podcast we can reach a plethora of the world we can reach so many different audiences and interviewing people from all over the world the caribbean africa the united states england everywhere we want to get these stories out there we want to get our narratives we are rewriting everything and rewriting our own narratives and we're getting the blind stigma out we're getting the stories out we're changing the stigma it is going to change lives That was Stacey Ann Buchanan addressing the blind stigma around mental health in the Afro-Caribbean communities. To find out more about Stacey Ann, visit her website at stacyannbuchanan.com. You can now access Impact online on SoundCloud and Spotify at Vibe105TO. And before we leave, we'd like to extend our thanks to Stacey Ann Buchanan and VX3Exchange. Impact is a production of VX3 Exchange, featuring the stories of extraordinary people, sharing their stories again and again at VX3Exchange.com or our social platforms at VX3Exchange.